to Genesis chapter 29. I have a quite lengthy passage to read, <clears throat> but I want to read through most of 29, or part of 29, and most of 30. And I want to speak about Jacob's progeny. Jacob's progeny. These are, we will read, and actually from another passage, we will see the, the birth of the 12 sons of Jacob. But before I read this passage, let me say that this is probably not a passage that you will hear read at the First Baptist or the First Presbyterian Church downtown. Most people wouldn't read this passage. <laughs> Did you read it, Mason? I know Paul read it. <laughs> Genesis chapter 29, I'll begin in verse 21. Remember, Jacob has went to Haran, and that's where Abraham first went when he left Ur of the Chaldees. So there were still kinfolk left there when, when Abraham then traveled on south into the promised land. So Jacob goes back to Laban. And it says in verse 21, And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening, that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, that is to Jacob, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpah, his maid for an handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, now what in the world Jacob was on when they had that party, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't tell us, but behold, it was Leah. He expected it to be Rachel. Yeah. And he said unto Laban, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? And he did. That was the agreement. Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and I will give thee this also for the service, which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. And Jacob did so, and fulfilled her week, and he gave unto him Rachel his daughter to wife also. And Laban gave to Rachel his, uh, his daughter Bilhah, his handmaid, to be her maid. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him, that is for Laban, yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For, said she, for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bare a son, and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again, and bare a son, and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me. This has got to be at least two years, three years. Joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons, therefore was his name called Levi. And she conceived again, this is the fourth one, and bare a son. And she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah, or that is praise, and left bearing. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. That's a tall order. <laughs> huh? Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And, and he said, Am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of thy womb? And she said, Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her. And she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. And she gave him Bilhah, her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went in unto her. And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. This is through Bilhah. And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again, and bare Jacob a second son. Jacob was a busy man, wasn't he? Our second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. 
and she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob to wife. Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. And Leah said, A troop cometh. And she called his name Gad. In other words, God's filling me up. You know? Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. She, and Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. There's another one. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field. It's told by aphrodisiacs. Now, I know they're probably not going to mention that in the First Baptist Church. I understand that, but that's what this is talking about. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field. It ain't talking about a swan. And brought them unto his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, Is it a small matter? Thou hast taken my husband, and wouldst thou also take away my son's mandrakes? And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. I'm assorted, eh? And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, Thou must come in unto me, for surely I have hired thee with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire, because I, because I have given my maid to my husband, and she called his name Issachar. That is hire. Yeah. And Leah conceived again and bare Jacob the sixth son. And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun. And afterwards she bare a daughter and called her name Dinah. God remembered Rachel. God hearkened unto her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God had taken away my reproach. She called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. And then it comes to pass. You see all this time. There's 11 sons born to Jacob. They're all his sons. They're not all by the same woman. But they're all his sons. Now turn over for the last one, chapter 35. And verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel. A lot of time has passed now. They journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, she died in childbirth, giving, giving birth, that she called his name Benoni, 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 sorry about that. But his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way of Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. But I want to read a little bit more. There's the 12 sons. There's the progeny of Jacob. But look what else it says. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhi, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. Do you think that's going to be in the mid-level Sunday school lesson for all the kiddies today? You think they're going to read that passage? No. No. What a happy, functional family unit we find here, don't we? Uh-huh. I'm being tongue-in-cheek. You understand that. Oh, the glories and the union of polygamy. This brings everybody together, don't it? Huh? No. No. Fallen man knows no bounds to his depravity except God himself restrain. Exactly. That's what we see. That's what this is here for. Yeah. To remind us what we truly are by nature. We have here deception, hatred, avarice, envy, one-upmanship, sexual slavery. Those two handmaids, they got caught in the middle, didn't they? Huh? Sexual slavery, aphrodisiacs, and sexual manipulation. 
don't we? Even trade and sex. Right? Oh, the corruption of such archaic peoples and practices. Yeah. No. Oh, the corruption of me. Exactly. Oh, the corruption of you. Yes, sir. Oh, the corruption of us all by nature. Solomon was quite clear, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8, There is not a just man upon the face of the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Amen. Sometimes men may do good things. They may do good things. But they never do good things and not sin. There you go. <laughs> That's it. They never do good things and not sin. It's not what I, I do. I sin sometimes and I do good at other times. No, even when we try to do good, maybe even do good, it's still shot full of hell. Exactly. Because it comes forth from us. I realize this is probably not, not one of the most exciting passages in Scripture to read. Or maybe it is. Did I say that? I meant to say that. You got any skeletons in your closet? God's word is brutally honest even concerning his own people. Yes, it is. I don't know whether everybody involved here was saved or not. That's not the point. But these people and these 12 sons who came about in the way that you see, you read coming about, came about by the foreordination of God Almighty. Yes, sir. And Joe's done so, well, you're making God the author of sin. Don't be stupid. I won't be as nice as Joe was. Don't be stupid. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And there's a time to be born. And each one of these boys were born. And even that girl was born according to God Almighty's sovereign ordination. Yes, sir. And every one of while wow, these people's Deeds and innermost actions are exposed to the world yeah. by God. And mine may not be, but I've got skeletons in my closet that I'm ashamed of. Yes, sir. And I pray God they don't ever come out of the closet. Yeah. That's the big thing today. Now to do is come out of the closet, ain't it? That's what they say. I come out of the closet. I think, what are you living in the closet for? <laughs> Again, I'm a bit of smart aleck. No, there are some things that need to remain in the closet. But yet God is honest enough to expose us all through these people right here. Yes, sir. Through these people. Look at our country. All of this and much more. And I don't have to go any further. I text most of you that I knew I could text. And told you yesterday, you know, the, was it yesterday? Friday. That the Supreme Court had just spit in the face of God. Mankind did that once before. You remember? They hit him and they spit on him, Joe. Yes, sir. Look at our country. All of this that we read right here and even much more. And apart from God's restraining hand, these people would have done much more as well. Oh, yeah. It's not just these, those ancient backward peoples that lived in tents. Yeah, you're right. The corruption of modern civilized man knows no bounds other than the bounds that God Almighty sovereignly decreed and holds in order. That's it. One of Job's friends, though he misapplied what he said, what he said was still true. How abominable and filthy is man That's right. that drinketh up iniquity like water. That's right. It's not just those old, ancient, archaic people. It's me. I see me in this passage. I see you in this passage. Yes, sir. Drink up iniquity like water. And yet, in all this, Back then, and even right now, what do we see? Chapter 29, 29, verse 31, we see the Lord at work. Yeah. Yeah. See it? 
And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened up her womb. But he kept Rachel's womb shut. That's you right. see that? Yes, sir. We see the Lord at work right in the midst of all this. And in the midst of all that we see happening in our country and all the things that we see taking place, I am here to announce before this little group and anyone else who hears it that God Almighty is still at work. Doing his will in the, amongst the armies of heaven and amongst the inhabitants of the earth. Amen. Well, if they can do that, I can. No, you probably have. There you go. <laughs> Don't come and tell me about, well, I can do that. No, you probably already have. Tim James once said, people say, but what if? He said, what if? He says, you have. That's right. You have. But I can, I, can, can I, I can do that too. Yeah, you will do that. You're giving me a license to sin. Let's see, I might have one. There you go. Let me give it to you. Yeah. Let you take it before God at the judgment bar. Huh? You think that's going to work? What if I write out, here is Walter Pendleton's license to, he'll put your name on there, here's your license to sin. Think that's going to do you any good? Exactly. Don't be so nonsensical. Don't be so nonsensical. According to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9 and verse 18, God has mercy on whom he will have mercy. And whom he will. What does he do? He hardens. Amen. Well, if they can do that, I can do that. No, we are doing that. Exactly. And it's nothing but the free, sovereign, absolutely free gift of God in compassion and mercy that any of us are saved. Yeah, that's right. Jacob, before he was born, and his brother Esau, before he was born, and they were twins. And it said, the children, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand. It was said unto the mother, the elder shall serve the younger. Jacob, I love. Esau, I hate. Amen. You know what it says? Amen. Mercy and compassion is in God's hand to give. Yes, and not just withhold, yeah. but to harden. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what we see taking place <laughs> in our country and around the world today yes, is sir. God Almighty being sovereign and hardening some folks. When they light up the White House with the rainbow colors. That's men being hardened by God. Well, I don't know about a God like that. Yeah, you're exactly right. You don't know him. You don't know him. Not only do we see the Lord at work, we see the Lord being praised. Chapter 29, verse 35. This is Leah. She conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. I will call his name praise. <laughs> Judah. But, but that's Leah. She was wronged, wasn't she? She was wronged. I mean, her father was deceitful when he gave her to Jacob. It's supposed to have been Rachel to start with. But according to their custom, it shouldn't have ever been offered to start with. It should have been Leah, yeah. right? She'd done wrong. She'd been wronged. Yeah, she'd been wronged, but that's not the point. It's really not the point. Because we see God answering prayer. And look at whose prayer he answered. Chapter 30, verse 17. Or I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's the... We see God not just answering prayer. We see God... Look at chapter 30. I'm sorry, verse 22. And God remembered who? Rachel. Yes, sir. <laughs> Even after this episode of verses 14 through 18. Yeah, exactly. Even after selling out or selling of mandrakes for sex. Right? We see God answering prayer in chapter 30, verse 17, even after all of this. Saved people are sinners still. They're sinners still. Yes, sir. But saved sinners praise God in spite of themselves. Yes, sir. You hear me? They praise God because of Him, yeah. not because of themselves. Exactly. 
They praise God for his mercy and compassion in spite of themselves. We see God answering prayer. We see God being mindful even to a sinner. And God remembered Rachel. Oh, to be remembered by God. Huh? To be remembered by God. But that's at his sovereign discretion. Yes, sir. Right? What had she done to be remembered by God? Yeah. Go back and read those verses again. Yeah. Mm. The truth of free grace still shines bright today. The words were evidently common amongst the believers of Paul's day because in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, Paul says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Sinners. Amen. And until God Almighty forces you yeah. to take your place there, you won't know anything about salvation. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Because that's the only kind God saves. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Faithful. It's a faithful saying. Worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And even the Apostle Paul being inspired writing that very moment. The, the exact words that God intended to be pinned onto the page. Said of whom I used to be chief. Exactly. No. Of whom I am chief. Amen. Paul still says I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells a lot of bad exactly. no that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing yeah. my last point man it ain't even 15 till I could spread this out a little bit <laughs> sin now listen to me I'm not pausing because I don't know what to say I'm pausing because I want you to listen to what I say. Sin cannot compete with grace. Amen. Do you hear me? Amen. Sin cannot compete with grace. Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 5 and we'll see that. Yes, sir. This one verse for right now, verse 19 of Romans 5. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Yes. You and I had no say in that matter. Exactly. When Adam rebelled in that garden, we were all then made sinners. By one man's one act of disobedience, we were made sinners. Yes, sir. Oh, God just struggles with that now, don't he? Uh, oh, poor God. Oh, Sin wasn't just so bad. No. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Amen. You see that? Sin cannot compete with grace. That's exactly right. Can it? Well, you sent away your day of grace. If you can send away grace, grace ain't worth having. That's exactly right. That kind of grace ain't worth having because it'll do you no good if you're a sinner. Amen. <laughs> Is That's it? it. That's exactly. but, but pastor, those, those people didn't have the law. They didn't. You're right. They didn't have the law. Mason, there were a lot of things that they were not directly instructed by God concerning yet. True. Were they? They, in a very large degree, walked only according to conscience. Didn't they? That's all they had. They didn't have any, they didn't have any written word of God even yet. Yeah. There was no scripture, David, until Moses began to write. That's when scripture began to come. Even scripture began to all of everything else was the promises of God passed down by what? Word of mouth. And you know how we distort that. You ever sit around the old circle around the fire and somebody tells the story, time it gets back to you, it ain't nothing like yeah. You know what you started, and I, I know there's always one or two in the in the middle somewhere that change it just on purpose. Yeah. And men still do that concerning the gospel today. Yeah. 
Don't they? They lie on God just to lie on God. You're right. Well, they didn't have the law. You're exactly right. But, verse 20, moreover, the law entered and man was just, now he's enlightened. Man, when the law came, man just got better, didn't he? Uh, exactly. Now we have the instruction. Now we know what's right and what's wrong. Now we see it in black and white. There, there it is. Great. No, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Amen. As Henry Mahan once said, laws make rebellious man even more rebellious. There you go. We break them just to be able to break them. You're right. That's it. Tell your kid not to do something. What are they probably going to do? The very thing you tell them not to do. I remember my grandfather years ago, we were having a family reunion, and it rained quite heavy, I guess, that morning or maybe the night before. And there was a lot of kids there, young ones. And people were saying, well, oh, 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 I hope they don't get out there and get in that mud hole. Don't go get, I hope they don't get, they'll get themselves filthy, they'll track all this filth in, into our kinfolks' home. So you know what my grandpa did? He went out and told every one of them, I want y'all to go play in that mud hole. Go down there and jump around. And you know what? Not a one of them wanted to go near it once he said that. <laughs> Not a one of them wanted to go near it when he, when he said don't do it. Why? Because we want to rebel just for rebellion's sake. That's exactly right. I, I. I, me, me, me. And that's what we read over there in Genesis chapter 29 30, don't we? A lot of I and me. And. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. License to sin? No, look. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, yeah. grace did super abound. Amen. It did much more abound. I'm here to say sin cannot compete with grace. Amen. Well then, but you know, but some people die and go to hell. That's right, because God purposed that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's true. That's right. Yes. Because God foreordained that. Yes, sir. That's why. It ain't because God couldn't save them. It's because God didn't purpose to save them. What's that? Is that clear enough? Yeah. That's what this book teaches. What is that? He has mercy on whom I have mercy, and whom he will, he'll do what? Amen. He hardens. It's not God making a good person bad. No, it's God hardening the bad to start with. And we're all bad to start with. I see me in Rachel. I see me in Leah. I see me in Bilhah. I see me in Zilpah. I see me in Jacob. I see me all over the place. Don't you? You see yourself there? License to sin? No, look at what he says. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness whenever you do it. Whenever you are righteous. Is that what it says? No. Through righteousness unto eternal life by who? Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It will if God Almighty's purpose grace. Yeah. Listen to me. Yeah. If God Almighty's purpose grace, you cannot sin and compete with that grace. That's right. Can't do it. But shall we that are, no. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Yeah. How shall we that are dead to sin? Yeah. And that has to be positional. Yeah, exactly. Because it's not practical in my life. Oh, that's right. You're right. Yeah. Then read it. You'll see it. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now listen to me. Continue in sin, those who are dead to it cannot. You know what I said? In this context, yeah. look at what he actually teaches there. To continue in sin, those that are dead to sin cannot. But continue to sin, they do. That's it. Yes, sir. You see the difference? Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? Now, anybody doubts that, then you're, you've never, at least, you've, you've evidently not read. You certainly haven't heeded what John wrote in 1 John chapter 1. Yeah. Right? Boy. All this, you can't take one passage to play against another in Scripture. They all stand right where they stand, meaning exactly what the writer meant when he wrote it down. And this is what John says, John 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin... 
Yeah. We deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is necessary because I still continue to sin. Yes, sir. Even though I don't live in sin. Uh -huh. I don't understand that. If God saved you, you understand that. Because you know it to be a reality in your life, whether you can theologically expound upon it or not. You know it's the reality. Look, and I do like, I remember every time I read that verse, I think of Art Nguyenswander. He said, notice in verse 9, there's only one thing we do. That's confess. God does everything else. Yes, sir. <laughs> you see that? I like that. If we confess our sins, he's what? Just and faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, well, I'm done with that. It's all over with me. I, I don't sin anymore. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. I'm not giving you license to sin. No. Nope. That's, That's what he's saying, exactly right? Exactly right. I write to you telling you don't sin. And if any man sin, yeah. we have an advocate. Oh. Amen. Oh, thank God. Yeah. That doesn't make me want to pull out my license, David. It makes me want to thank God for his free, sovereign mercy and compassion. It, if only I could truly live the way that inspires my mind and heart to live. If only I could. But I can't. I can't. Look, and if any man, what? Sin. Not if any man confess. But if any man sin, we have an advocate. We confess because the advocate is there already. Yeah. You see that? Yes, sir. I know most people, they, they turn that right around and lie on God. Now, if you'll just confess that Christ will be your advocate. Uh-uh. Yeah, when God's people sin, Christ is already their advocate. He's already been advocating for them. He is advocating for them, and he shall advocate for them. Amen. Well, that ain't fair. No, that's grace. Yeah, that's right. It ain't about fairness. If it's fair, we all go to hell. Exactly. It's about grace. Amen. And sin... I'll say it again, sin cannot compete with grace. Amen. Aren't you glad? Yes, sir. Aren't you glad? Think of it. Every time a young boy's name was called, it's a car. It's a car. Where are you at? It's dinner time. It's a car. You know what the name it's a car means, don't you? Now turn back to it. Higher. Higher every time his name was called was a, a, a remembrance of what? Give me some mandrakes. What do you mean? I ain't giving you my mandrakes. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll let you have sex with our husband if you give me your mandrakes. You can go first tonight. You hear it? Called his name Issachar, my hire. <laughs> How'd you like your name to mean that? <laughs> yeah. You know what? It does. <laughs> It does. Yep. Whether you know it or I know it or not, it does. Think of it. It's a car. Come change your clothes. Get ready for supper. My hire. My hire. Now, now go read the seven. Now go read the twelve or seven. Where did I get that from? Go read the twelve sons of Jacob's names. And let it remind you every time that you say your own name, I'm nothing but a corrupt wretch in God's sight apart from his sovereign grace in Christ Jesus. A remembrance of sin. When I see me, you know what I see? Every time I begin to take a good look at me, you know what I see? All oh, there's, I, I believe God. I have to repent all the time. I'm ashamed of myself most of the time. Oh, yeah, those are good things. But you know what? When I see me, you know what I see? Sin. Yes, sir. Corruption. Unbelief. Yeah. Even un that nasty, foul bird infests my cage called unbelief. Yeah. But when I see Christ, you know what I see? Yeah. You know what I see? absolute sanctification for me. Look, go read Hebrews chapter 10. Absolute perfection for me. Yes, sir. When I see him. He is the Lord 
our righteousness. He don't just give. He does give. Oh, yeah. But he, David, he is my righteousness. Exactly. Apart from that kind of righteousness, even what God does to me and in me, I would still be damned forever. That's right. Sin has to be dealt with. And it was in my substitute. Amen. Every one of these sins these people did. All of this avarice and corruption, sexual manipulation, it all was suffered by Jesus Christ. He suffered for it. He was punished for it. It is no marvel that God says, I am a just God and a Savior, and there's nobody else like me. How can God be just and a Savior at the same time? In the substitute. That's the only way. A just God and a Savior, and it is no wonder that he says in Isaiah 45, 21 through 25, those very words, and then he says, Look unto me, and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth. I don't care who you are. David, whether your skin's black or white or green, doesn't matter. Look to him. Look to him and be saved. What about all that election stuff? Don't worry about all that. Look unto me and be you saved. Right? That's what it says. Look unto me, you old sinner. How many of you are sinners this morning? I am. Old sinner, when you sin, look to Christ. You hear me? When you sin, look to Christ. When you do good, especially then. Look to Christ. Amen. Uh, you hear me? Yeah. Even when you do good, especially then, don't look to that. Yeah. Look to Christ. Exactly. Look to Christ. Listen to Isaiah 64. Turn there if you, if you would. I want to read that and I'll close. And Isaiah 64. But we all... <clears throat> Are as an unclean thing. Yes, sir. Are. You see that? Yeah. Even Isaiah was including himself when he wrote that. Was he not? Yes, sir. Wasn't he, Mason? But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness says yeah. are as filthy rags. I don't believe he's being metaphorical or anything. He means exactly, my best deeds are filthy rags in God's sight. And most of you all here knows what that really means, filthy rags. Filthy rags in God's sight. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself. Shoot free will will in the head right now. Well, wait a minute, you can't because it don't really exist. So you can't do that. There's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, aren't you thankful for that? Huh? As Tim James often says, that small but mighty conjunction. But. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay. And thou, our potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. You see that? O sinner, look to Christ. Period. Father, as we continue here. May it be with hope and joy in our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you in his name. Amen.